Chrissy Asari, thanks very much for making time with us uh, for the news. Coming up over the next 60 minutes. Parliament set to consider key bills, including the one on political vigilantism, as House rises today. Also in the bulletin, hundreds of Midland Savings Company customers demand their locked-up deposits. And also on the international front, Sudan's military leaders reassure people protesting against its coup as standoff continues. Media pages that's on TV3 Ghana, on Twitter, and on Facebook. Now, hundreds of workers of Midland Savings and Loans are protesting, uh, they are, de are demanding their deposits from the company in Medina. Our correspondent George Quinn joins us live uh, from the grounds. Now, George, uh, what has necessitated this demonstration? Hello, George, can you hear me? Yeah, Papasi, good afternoon. Right, so what has necessitated this demonstration by uh, customers of Midland Savings and Loans? Okay, so Papasi, basically, some of these customers complain that any time they besiege the companies who access their funds, they cannot access them. And it's been with them for close to a year now. And earlier there were assertions by the company that they are not facing any liquidity challenge. And for these customers, that is untrue. Because if that's the case, they should be able to access their funds. And that is not forthcoming. Communication is not forthcoming. Something they think they are saying will worsen the applied. At least if the company comes forward with information, gives some sort of assurance to these customers, you know, things will be put to normal. They can just come the next. But communication is not forthcoming. And for them, if nothing is done about this, they'll continue with process until their locked up funds are paid them. Uh, George, what's been the reaction of management to this very latest development? I tried uh, the customers there. All right, thank you very much, uh, George. Quinnin is our reporter on the ground where uh, some aggrieved customers of Midland Savings and Loans are protesting to demand their unpaid uh, deposits. Meanwhile, some aggrieved customers of GN Bank and Goco Securities are demanding full payment of their locked up funds. They contend workers whose salaries are channeled through the bank are paid far less than what is due them. According to the aggrieved customers, businesses of some customers are collapsing as a result of their locked up funds despite promises by the bank to have effected payment by March 2019. The most painful aspect of this issue is the silence nature of these companies that they wouldn't even give us any information and then the aspect of forcing members to go onto their new product that is not even approved by SEC. Convener of the group, Isaac Nyababora, lamented some government workers who receive salaries through the bank only end up getting 50 cities at the end of the month, no matter how much is being paid them. The questions we are asking is that, when are we going to get our monies? We have not gotten any answers to this issue and we feel that we must let the world know that Park Sindum and his group are not above the law. The GN Bank was downgraded to a savings and loans company following the banking sector cleanup, which required universal banks to shore up their minimum capital from 120 million cities to 400 million cities. Away from that, a bill to disband vigilantism has been laid before Parliament for consideration and approval under a certificate of urgency. My colleague Komla Kluche reports the minority has ever kicked against its urgent passage, calling for broader consultations. Stakeholders stormed Parliament in what can be described as efforts to make input into the Vigilantism and Related Offences Bill 2019. The Attorney General Gloria Ekufo presented before Parliament a new bill seeking to criminalize and disband all forms of political vigilantism in the country. AG is asking parliamentarians to under a certificate of urgency approve the Vigilantism and Related Offences Bill 2019. Leaked contents of the bill have named the Hawks, Invisible Forces, Delta Force, the Azoka Boys, Bamba Boys, Kandahar Boys, and the Borga Bulldogs as the known vigilante groups the bill seeks to disband. A supportive house on the bill, yet divisive on the approach to have the bill passed. 
The Commission of Enquiry report on ISO Wagon, as required by Article 280 of the Constitution, has not been published. I respect the Attorney General and her knowledge of constitutional law and its principles. I can understand the President is in a hurry to deal with it. We think that there must be multi stakeholder consultation. The scourge of visit licensing is bigger than the NDC and the NPP. It's a national problem. As leader of government business, I also have to show why government is committed to passing this bill under the presidency. The speaker, and I know that on the 199, as you rightly directed, and also Article 10613 of the Constitution, settle the matter. The issue of the Commission of Empire that was raised by the minority leader, Mr. Speaker. The minority leader espoused the argument of the bill not gazetted as stands the speaker, Professor Michael Quay shredded. We are masters of our own procedures. So says the Supreme Court. Anyone who is worried about the constitutionality thereof, we want to test it in the Supreme Court, mindful of the Supreme Court's own ruling of the mastership that this honorable house has over its own proceedings. The speaker, however, referred the bill. Meanwhile, the ranking member on the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee has raised doubts the bill will receive the appropriate scrutiny. And when the bill is taken under a state of urgency, immediately that decision is taken on the floor, you go immediately into second region. Okay, and then you would work on the bill to finish the bill by the close of sitting or latest tomorrow. Uh, but the nature of the bill and the, the matters that it is seeking to regulate, in my view, in my view, requires broader consultation. It cannot, it might be ineffective in dealing with vigilantism. We need the Peace Council. We need IDEC, which has been speaking on this matter. We need the police who have displayed on their walls that vigilantism is a threat to our democracy. We need to understand why, in their view, they think that vigilantism is a threat to democracy and why they have been unable to control vigilantism. If it's situation specific, they're talking about routing or an act which is not conducive to the peace of the nation. This is all like a broad, I mean, based law. But if it's situation specific that it is an illegality for anybody to raise vigilante groups, and the sentence for that is 10 years without an option to a fine, then the deterrence of that, I mean, I mean, a sanction regime is clear. So we should take it under certificate of agency because we can't afford to have these groups in our backyard. The nation should be rife for peace, and we shouldn't have anything that would disturb the peace of this country. All right, so the Vigilantism Bill seeks to clearly ban all activities of land guards uh, as well. Let's get on uh, Skype right now and speak to Adam Bona. He's a security analyst. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Bona, for joining us on Midday Live. So, first of all, what do you make of the back and forth uh, that's going on in Parliament as to whether or not this uh, particular bill should be passed under a uh, certificate of urgency? Yeah, thank you very much. Good afternoon to your viewers. Well, I think that uh, for such a law, uh, there is the need to have broad, you know, uh, stakeholder discussion, consultations. And I'm, I'm saying this because, you know, vigilantism didn't start today. It's been with us for decades. And so if you want to ban something that has been with us for decades, you want to rather take your time, bring on all the stakeholders, let people uh, advise with regards to make input into the bill, but to pass it under certificate of agency i mean i for me i think that might be an anomaly because then the issue of vigilantism affects everybody in ghana businesses individuals schools affects everybody even the media media houses have been attacked everybody you know politicians police stations tell me everyone is under attack by this you know hoodlums and so if we need to pass such a law there is a need for us to have you know proper way of doing it, you know, involve those who would be able to speak to it. I had a conversation with, uh, I think he's the chairman of the Legal and Constitutional uh, Committee in Parliament, uh, Honorable 
Ben Abdallah. And the assurance I got was that they might not pass the bill today, uh, they, before Parliament, you know, would rise. And so I'm very hopeful that uh, some of us, I would make recommendations, I've, re you know, reviewed it. I'll make recommendations with regards to what, to me, would constitute more, uh, you know, deterrence in terms of uh, getting people punished and people uh, staying away from forming this type of groups. And so there is a need for us to uh, do a proper uh, consultation instead of just uh, passing it under the ticket of uh, urgency. Right, Mr. Bona. Uh, many had anticipated the content uh, of this bill. Uh, now we do know that it goes further to include the activities of land guards. Um, do you have any problem with the expansive nature of, of the bill as it stands? No, I think I don't have any problem with it because if you look at Langard, Langardism and vigilantism, these you, you know, vigilantism is an offshoot of what you call it, Langardism. And so when they don't have anything doing, uh, protecting other people's lands, and it is, we are in the political season, they move, they gravitate towards, you know, uh, vigilantism. And so I think that you cannot actually do away with vigilantism without looking at, you know, uh, where the source is. The source of vigilantism is Langardism. And so if this thing has to be dealt with, I think Langardism is very important. But if you look at that aspect of Langardism uh, in the bill, that has not been properly dealt with because then there are a lot of loopholes I have seen, even though uh, I'm yet to. I've done some amount of review, hope, hoping that I will finish it and send it to them in Parliament to look at if there is a need uh, to consider some of my recommendations. Yes, they put it, they, they, they add it to uh, the bill that is going to be passed. And so I don't have any problem with it. It's the right way to go. It All is right. how this bill would be implemented. Mm. All right, thank you very much, uh, Adam Bona. Thanks very, very much for your time. Uh, Adam Bona is a security analyst uh, there. You're still watching Media Live here on TV3. We're streaming live on Facebook. You can also join us with the views, comments, and suggestions on any of our top stories this hour. Visit any of our social media pages, uh, TV3 Ghana, on Facebook and on Twitter. Now, let's go to Parliament and uh, the House is rising today for the Easter uh, festivities. The House is expected to adjourn late tonight and will consider a number of bills, including the vigilantism bill. Uh, but first, the House is currently debating whether or not to pass the ministerial nominee for Bono uh, region. That's uh, Evelyn Kuma Richardson. Uh, let's go live to the uh, floor now and join our correspondent, Kuma Kloche. To us, uh, uh, Chamber, and show you the debate for the president's nominee uh, for the regional minister for the Bono region is still being uh, done in the house. The house is sharply divided over whether to accept the nomination of uh, Madame Evelyn, Madame Evelyn Amakumi Richardson. There has been several issues raised about her. The issue concerning the degree of the PhD which uh, she had acquired um, at the committee seating, it was identified that uh, the the PhD that she was offered or she had was allegedly fake. The committee, most especially the minority, has raised issues about is that they, they needed proof. In fact, she had used it at certain points. In some instances, she had not used it again. But, I mean, the minority leader is on his feet now. You can see him in the background. He is uh, making a strong, strong argument that, well, all the matters that they are raising, that the minority is raising, uh, does not hold water. And that should not prevent them from discussing it. I can tell you, Parkwesi, they have been debating this for the past 45 minutes. It tells you uh, uh, about, 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 about 16 uh, uh, nominees uh, had their appointment approved by Parliament Appointment Committee, but she's the only one who um, has not had has done uh, yet, and it's because of the controversy. So this is what they are raising. The House, however, will take a decision on it subsequently. But away from this, I can tell you, we say it's a very, very tall order for today. Let me just run by you what the order paper is looking like. In terms of motions, uh, the, we have the adoption of the President's Committee uh, on, on, on um, 
the adoption of the, the report of the appointments committee which is currently one is actually item number one then also the second one has to do with adoption of the mines and energy committee report for the 2019 work program for the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation mind you this three days ago was done but they raised issues speaker raised issue uh, and uh, uh, the house raised issues about it and it has been put on hold today they are rising it is likely that they are going to adopt it um, they would also be holding the adoption of the finance committee report on tax with it's quite a tall order uh, not 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 less than 10 though um, have been listed on the order paper but one other bill we are expecting uh, to be passed by the house is the vigilante and other rela uh, related offenses act 2019 which was submitted to the house by the attorney general yesterday under a certificate of urgency that has uh, been referred to the committee on constitutional legal and parliamentary affairs uh, to delve into has been done but i'm just going to run by you um, what 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 the house has been doing for the 2018 or the 2019 period in terms of the bills that uh, they have passed i'll just run by them quickly as they are rising uh, the exemptions bill 2019 was passed by the house the appropriation bill 2018 was passed by the house and the income tax am amendment uh, number two bill 2018 was also passed by the house the luxury vehicle levy bill was also passed by the house and also the exercise tax stamp the university for business and an integrated development studies bill 2018 yes was passed the public holidays amendment are the library services uh, bill then the university of technology and applied sciences bill then the ghana book development bill was also passed mind you the controversial uh, right to information bill was also passed by the house for this particular uh, seat in the third session of the seventh parliament as they are rising tonight it's going to be a tall order speaker said brazer there's a lot of work to be done this is what the house is now but you can see before you wrap up you see that the debate is still ongoing and they're sharply divided as to how it's going to go it's likely to go for voting the house is almost full we'll see whether the majority will have their way or the minority would have their way as speaker is likely to put it to vote back to you in the studios back with you. Thank you very much, Kamala Kalucha, reporting live from Parliament there. The Accra Metropolitan Assembly says it is not prepared for the rains despite the meteorological agency's warning of heavy rains this year. According to the director at the Drains Maintenance Unit, Graham Saba, drains to collect heavy volumes of water are yet to be realigned and redesigned due to financial constraints. My colleague Evelyn Tingma has more. Four people, including a pregnant woman at Dansuman Flamingo, died in last Sunday's 40 to 45 minutes downpour in Accra. We can't remove the gutters because these gutters are very deep. So at first, anytime it rains, two, three days, they bring out people to come and dig out the gutters for the next raining season. But from some years now, it has been stopped. And when this place rains, nobody gets a, space, a, a place to pass. When it rains, it's more than a river. But when the gutter is not full, it passes through the gutters. But as soon as the gutter is full, it passes through the streets. This is the state of gutters here at Flamingo. This beautician tells me the whole area gets flooded any time it rains as a result of the choked drains. She says they have made efforts to clear the gutters off the field. I called the AMA office yesterday. So right after approaching them, then they'll give us people to do that. Some areas also got flooded on Sunday. <laughs> Residents of Adabraka Sahara claim the Odor drain has not been dredged for more than two years. This Odor River has not been drained, so when it rains small, it rains from the top. When it comes down, then it means flooding. Look at what has happened to our things, our relatives, with some of our motorbikes. Many things have spoiled in the Sunday rain that falls. So we are pleading to the government. We are pleading, we are pleading three times. 
They should try and come and trade the Udo River for us. When they trade this Udo River, I'm not sure we'll be into this trouble. But director of the Dre's maintenance unit of the AMA, Graham Saba, says they are not ready for the rains. Accra is simply not ready for the rains. For a long time, we've been talking of realigning and redesigning our drains. Up to now, we've not been able to do that. If you are able to realign, redesign all the drains that we, are, we have in the city, then of course we can say that we are ready for any storm waters that come. He described the desilting of existing drains as window dressing, requesting huge investment in storm drains. Every year we go and then we desilt the existing drains. Meanwhile, the existing drains, the capacity itself cannot carry the storm water if it rains above a certain threshold. So that's the situation which we are. Let us face facts and then find solutions to the problem. Then where the population is very tense in areas where you have a lot of people. I would suggest that we even cover the drains there so that people don't put garbage into the drain. The sorting is very expensive, very, very expensive. And two years ago, if we visited the door, and this year we are doing it, I don't see anything so much. There was no dredging on Tuesday when the news team visited the Kwame Nkrumah Circle area. We are at the Kwame Nkrumah Circle here in Accra and this is the Odor drain. It is one of the major causes of flooding in Accra, especially this particular area. Now, if you look into the drain, you will see lots of plastic waste in it. And we are told the whole of this year, this particular drain has not been dredged. And if you see, lots of people live around the area. And the metro department has already told us that they will be experiencing lots of rains and tender storm this year. You can see this building, somebody is just living close to the drain and you can imagine when it rains where this person will be placed. But this machine was at the same location on Thursday. But the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, says it is prepared for the rains. We don't know the volumes. We don't know what is likely to happen. So we preposition men for response. And so we have an urban search and rescue unit of men trained who are always ready to move to search and rescue to save lives of people who are affected, distress during rainfall. And so when the forecast is received, this group of people are also trained. And I remember this year, because we received the forecast, that the outlook was not going to be very good. We did this watermanship training at Dawenya and then to prepare our people for search and rescue operations. As the rains set in, one can only hope and pray lives are not lost and property destroyed as city authorities and other agencies appear helpless. The story was by Evelyn Tengma. You're still watching Media Live here on TV3. Uh, we're still uh, live, streaming live on Facebook. And meanwhile, government says it is unable to tell when dredging of the Kali Lagoon will be over, considering the volume of silt in it. Work, works and Housing Minister Samuel Azachia says Cabinet has been given a comprehensive plan for counterpart funding to end the perennial flooding. The minister was given a statement in the House on the ministry's plans for the imminent rain-induced flooding. The meteor service has announced of storms and heavy rains in the coming days, which it contends will be devastating. Government has meanwhile earmarked 194.5 million cities to desilt drains and construct some new ones. You see, because the stand of uh, the silt is not cheap. It's like a main big drain which is supposed to be a river bed that we have succeeded in choking it with felt. It seems to me that the kind of felt level in the, uh, um, in the, the, the lagoon, uh, it will take a lot of effort to clear. Meanwhile, Parliament has ratified the Budapest Convention on ways to prevent cyber crime. In this area, all our actions are interlinked and we need to cooperate and collaborate amongst ourselves to ensure that the policies are being implemented across the entire sector. As they say, 
a chain is as strong as it's weak. We will be a part of the group that is, is setting the policies, uh, the policy framework in place for implementation and adoption of the Budapest Convention rules across the 62 member states. You're still watching Media Life here on TV3. Uh, we now bring you our MTN uh, video report where our citizen journalist Rafael Dogbe reports on the covering of an exposed high tension cable after we aired his first on April 9, 2019. The situation, according to him, persisted for almost two years. This cable is a high tension cable. This cable has been left unattended to for almost two years now. And I don't know what they're waiting to happen before they come and attend to this cable. Children play here. We've reported this case to the authorities, but to no avail. We are calling on the authorities to come and attend to this cable before there's disaster. TV3, this a day after you showed the video clip concerning the exposed high tension cable in the Dane team in the western region the authorities have come to fix the problem so you can see from the video clip that they've covered the whole cables with earth we are most grateful to you Rafael Dogbe reporting from Adin team Takwadi western region And just like Rafael Dogway, you can also send your video report via WhatsApp on 055 1433044. You're still watching Media Live here on TV3. Still ahead, we've got international news, we've got the very latest in business, and we've got sports news coming up. Welcome to the business news segment of Midday Life here on TV3. The Auditor General, Daniel Domelevo, says internal auditing in Ghana is extremely weak as most internal auditors have been compromised by their employers. At a forum on disallowance and surcharge, he advocated the internal audit law to be reviewed to centralize practitioners under one agency. As at the end of November last year, more than 67.3 million CDs in disallowance and as its surcharge had been recovered from organizations and individuals by the internal auditor. At the forum organized by the Ghana Integrity Initiative, GII, the Auditor General entreated spending officers to keep records of all expenditure in line with the financial administration regulations in order to respond quickly to audit observations. If there is any loss or deficiency suffered by the government, whoever is responsible for that deficiency or whose negligence brought it about can also be censured. That one is broad, isn't it? So once we see a loss, then we have to know who is the father of this loss. He said the Auditor General's department since last year has been auditing public constructions and will do same to projects under the Sino-Hydro deal. We have moved onto the roads and into government construction to see if the roads are being constructed according to specification or the buildings are being put up according to specification. And I think it's timely, isn't it? Because I heard President commissioning infrastructure projects say, oh, this is very timely. So as they construct, we'll be following them to make sure that we get value for money. And let me be honest with you and say it again, it's not a witch hunting exercise. He bemoaned the state of the internal auditing in the country, advocating a change of the internal audit law to empower internal auditors. Internal audit is a function for management, provides information to management, gives assurance to management. So I think that 
on the weekly basis when Minister of Finance is meeting his officers. The internal auditor should be there. Should tell them that, oh, health say they need more money. They are even wasteful. They have so much money in their accounts, they are not using it well. Education, yes, they don't have money. So let's so they can guide the use of public funds. Executive Director of the Ghana Integrity Initiative, Linda Fori Kwafo, underscored the need for spending officers to be updated on the disallowance and surcharge law to avert infractions which usually lead to corrupt practices. After the Supreme Court's ruling in the case of Occupy Ghana versus Attorney General, the moment is appropriate for us to discuss what the allowance and say charge is all about. Mm -hmm. Why don't we bring the assemblies that we've been working with, the ministries, departments and agencies, for them to have here directly from the Auditor General to understand. People might have read the judgment, but they might not know um, how it works. Article 167 Clause 7B of the 1992 Constitution gives the Auditor General powers to disallow items of expenditure that are contrary to law and surcharging persons who paid authorized payments or received the payments contrary to law. The Institute of Chartered Economies of Ghana, ISEARCH, is suggesting that the central bank establishes an indigenous forex trading platform to help stabilize the local currency. CEO of ISEARCH, Gideon Emisa, noted the platform will give the regulator the much-needed monitoring. Currently, Ghana forex dealings are mostly conducted on the Reuters platform. Of course, you cannot control something that you, you don't have much authority on. That is why there is a need for us to to rethink and go around the table, sit and talk about how best we can have an indigenous, you know, forex trading platform. Forex tradings on the platforms require regulating the market. This is to ensure that licensed dealing operators do not go beyond a certain margin, though there is a demand on them to trade. Based on any demand that hits you as a licensed dealing operator, you are not supposed to go a certain margin, though the demand is on you, because uh, we're looking at the economy or the nation as, as, as large. As a licensed foreign exchange dealer, there is the need for you to be regulated. At the, thing, at the same time, we'll be able to check um, in terms of your margins or your pips, which you open the market or trade on the market, then that will be in our favor. CEO of the Institute of Chartered Economists of Ghana, Gideon Emisa, is suggesting that the regulator comes out with a local platform. And that's why we're calling on the policymakers to come in with that system where even during trading, you don't have to go beyond a certain margin as an economy. Once we have that and we have the inbuilt systems that will check your market opening position at the same time will check your trading patterns. Routers provides trading reporting solution to the Bank of Ghana through both Thompson Routers Deal Tracker and Thomson Routers Trade Notification Services. That's it for the very latest in business news here on Midday Live. For more business news stories, you can log on to our website, 3news.com. Away from that, uh, Chairman of the Ghana Education Service Council, Michael Sowa. Michael and Sowa, I beg your pardon, says the cost of the new school uniforms will be borne by parents and that the free school uniform policy was only enjoyed under the free compulsory universal basic education. The announcement of a new uniform for basic schools has generated a heated public debate with many questioning its importance. On 3FM Sunrise Morning Show, Michael Insoa defended the latest move and said this would boost the confidence of children. Where it's going to come from, he doesn't believe that uh, it is going to be different from what, they, uh, what parents have been buying for their children. So I don't know uh, why this person, where is it? The uniform they are wearing, where is the central source? So it means the parents would have to buy it? Yeah. In the past, there were uh, free school uniforms. We aren't going to do that anymore. Look, that free school uniform is a misunderstanding of what FQ provided. FQ provided that government responsibilities are listed, uh, books and so on and so forth. Uh, parents' responsibility, food, uh, transport, and clothing, or uniforms. Now, the free uniform concept was that uh, came about because we wanted every child to go to school, but in many deprived areas, children were not going to school because they couldn't afford 
uh, uniform. Now, the, the discourse on whether or not the use of celebrities by political parties sway votes during elections has surfaced again. Multiple award-winning actor John Dumelo is of the opinion that celebrities play a major role in helping political parties win elections. John Dumelo endorsed the NDC in 2016 and was seen on campaign platforms convincing electorates to vote for the party. The former Deputy General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress, Kokwanyido, recently disclosed the party party will limit the use of strangers and by extension celebrities in its 2020 campaign. But reacting to the comments, the actor stressed no political party can, uh, can do away with celebrities, noting celebs command a large following and to a large extent influence the outcome of elections. In other entertainment news, boss of Lynx Entertainment, Richie Mensah, has made known his intentions to contest for the vice president position in Musica's upcoming elections. Now, Richie is not the only person to have shown interest in vying for a position. Musica's current uh, first vice president, Bessa Simons, has also expressed his in intentions in contesting for the presidency. Richie has served as a director of music standards at Musica for the past three years. The decision to vie for the position of vice president comes in the wake of calls that Richie could do better when given a higher executive position. The celebrated sound engineer has over the period produced talents like Asem, Ziggy, Kiddy, Kwame Eugene, Ms. V, amongst others. Now, she is a favorite of many gospel music lovers. With a career spanning over four decades, the Sweet Sweet Jesus singer has inspired many through her songs. Here is a throwback to the 80s and 90s when the works of gospel music exponent and pace setter Reverend Dr. Mary Ganza dominated. Music icon Reverend Dr. Mary Gansa is revered for her admirable contributions to the growth of gospel music. Jesus, the acclaimed singer released her first song, God is Love, at age 15. Her debut album, Nyame Yodo, released in 1974, won the hearts of many music lovers. Songs on her second album, Onipa Bain, did not just propel Mary Gansa to stardom, it helped cement her place as a force to reckon with. <laughs> Mary Gansa boasts of mega hits like Sweet Sweet Jesus and Kechi and Nyame Yoto. The acclaimed vocalist is lauded for mentoring and inspiring many through her ministration. But after decades of active singing, the prolific composer stepped out of the limelight. Reverend Dr. Mary Ganta disagrees with assertions that she sank into oblivion. The role model revealed she took time off music to enroll in a school of theology as she believed her ministration must be Bible fact based. Aside updating herself, the singer also branched off to pastor a church. Mary Gansa, however, returned from her musical exile to her first love, music, celebrating her 40 years of singing and impacting lives in September 2018. The veteran musician is currently a member of Musica's National Election Committee, tasked to organize the union's June 26 elections. The gospel music scene looks saturated, but self-assured Reverend Gunter is positive on making a great impact, just like she did decades back. Well, that's all for Midday Live here on TV3. Thanks very much for watching. My name is Parker Tiasari. For more news, you can log on to our website, 3news.com.